the idea of the gaze, I think, is an eternally fascinating. The idea of looking and being looked at. Print friends, and welcome to the 33rd episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release an episode every two weeks, and on the off weeks, I publish an article on the Pine Copper Lime website, which features images and maybe a bit more information about the artist I'm going to interview. Happy mid February, print friends. We are officially starting to enter autumn here in the Southern Hemisphere, and the start of SGCI season has begun. For the uninitiated, SGCI stands for Southern Graphics Council International. It's an organization which every year hosts an event somewhere in the United States, which brings together hundreds and hundreds of printmakers for talks, demos, exhibitions, and usually more than a little debauchery. This year, it's all happening at the beginning of April in beautiful San Juan, Puerto Rico, and PCL is going to show up big time. We'll be at the vendor fair with buttons, stickers, tote bags, and whatever else I can afford to buy between now and then, as well as hosting a live, in-person recording of this very podcast. I hope to see you all there. Printmaking forever. Shun the non-believers. See you at the party. My guest this week is Rona Green. Rona is an Australian artist whose lino cuts of anthropomorphic animals explore identities, the ways we express them to the outside world, and the sides of ourselves we want to keep hidden. In this episode, we touch on maybe my top three favorite conversation topics outside of printmaking, dogs, tattoos, and competitive boxing. This interview has it all. Rona joined me from her studio in the Dandenong Vanges outside of Melbourne, so the sound quality isn't the absolute clearest, but you'll do all right. Maybe if you were planning on listening to this one while graining stones, skip ahead and come back when you're drawing. Rona is a wonderful, wonderful guest, so sit, stay, and prepare to express yourself with Rona Green. Hi Rona, how's it going? Hi, Miranda. Really good. Thank you. Good to talk to you. You too. You too. I'm really pleased I could get you on the podcast. It's pretty good timing. I think I met you maybe almost exactly a year ago today, I'm it thinking. Would be. Yeah. Yes, I think it would be about a year. Yeah, because yeah, we met at the uh, Mildura Print Triennial. Or no, is that what is the name of it? It's like the, is it just yes, called the IPT? IPT. Yes, Australian, they Aus- call it Australian that's Print right. Triennial. The Australian. Yes, and we were both speakers. You spoke wonderfully. Oh, it was a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I really enjoyed your talk and just thought you were a beautiful communicator about your work, doing beautiful work. For those of you out there listening who don't know Rona in her work, I'm hoping maybe you'd be willing to answer those great questions, who you are, where you are, and what you do. My name is Rona Green. I'm an artist and I love printmaking. I have a studio at my home and that's in the Dandenong Range in Melbourne, Australia. And I live with my partner, Aaron, and our companion, Umi the Greyhound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love I love the way you phrase that, our companion. Yeah, because it's... Yeah, very much so. Yeah, because someone who um, absolutely adores dogs and has had really deep connections with dogs in the past, it never feels quite right to say, like, this is my pet, this is the thing that I own, or, like, all that weird language around it. My dog, E.B., I used to say, this is my friend. Yes, <laughs> you know? exactly, yeah. <laughs> like, I think pet's like, more like for pet rock, isn't it, if you had a pet yeah. rock as a kid with the googly eyes. <laughs> exactly exactly like it just it doesn't seem as active as the relationship between dogs and people truly is is, is that's pet. right 
They're yeah. very, like very much a family member, aren't they? You were saying that you have been in that studio for about four years. Would you consider yourself a Melbourne artist or a Melbourne-based no. artist? Yeah, definitely now, sort of now. I've been in Melbourne a long time. I finished my degree at university in the mid-90s and moved to Melbourne then. But prior to that, I'd grown up in Geelong. Then after that, I'd gone to university in Bendigo. And so for people who don't know their Australian geography... Uh, down yeah. pat. So where I grew, was born, Geelong, is sort of a coastal town in Victoria. So we're in the southeast of Australia. So we get the super hot summer, but then the quite cold winter as well. When you were growing up in Geelong, was it a big town, a small town, an artsy town? It very much sort of had a small town mentality. Like if you were a bit different, you definitely knew you were, hmm. if you get what I mean. It was a place that I was happy to leave, sort of at the <laughs> end of my <laughs> my teens. But uh-huh. I'm sure a lot. You know, then again, the environment's really lovely. Like you know, it's near the, it's on the coast. There's lots of beaches nearby, all that kind of thing. You know, nothing wrong with that at all. But um, you know, it has a really nice art gallery, the Geelong Gallery. But not a huge art scene. Definitely not at that time. I wouldn't say no. So in that case, what role did art play growing up for you? Both my grandmothers and my great aunt, they really liked craft. So that was a massive part of my childhood. Like I really loved needlepoint in sort of an embroidered and cross stitch and petty point, learnt patchwork. You know, I remember at my grandma's house she had a oil painting on silk, I think it was, of flowers that she had done. She was very, also very musical, like my great aunt and my grandma both played the piano. I finished year 12 and I remarkably ended up with reasonably okay grades <laughs> and art was my best grade, so I was like, that was that, you know, and that made what I was thinking in my head, it sort of validated externally and made sense, oh, maybe I should follow this. So initially, I guess, being a little bit more sensible, I thought, oh, I'll go and study photography because, of course, you can look at fine art photography, you can look at commercial photography. So the course Mm. I started in Melbourne at a place called Australian um, College of Photography and Communication, I think it's called ACPAC was the acronym. It no longer exists, but they had a um, commercial stream and art stream. So in first year, you sort of started out doing both and then you'd end up deciding which one you wanted to follow. You know, I knew that you had an interest in photography. I didn't realize that you had the background in fashion photography, which very much kind of makes a light bulb go on in my head in terms of your aesthetic in your current bodies of work that you make. You know, they, of course, they seem very much like portraits, like specific portraiture of a specific individual of some kind. And, you know, I was seeing you know, that kind of that style of that documentary portraiture, maybe almost more in the 80s where you'd see something, someone like Marsha Burns or Sally Mann, that kind of like um, shot just straight on the subject, often looking directly at back at the viewer. But of course, you also see that in fashion photography as well. You see that in the glossy magazines. And so when you said something like Annie Leibovitz, where it is that, that line that's very often used where it feels like that a traditional portrait, but that's very sort of confrontational and documentary as well. Both of that definitely comes together in what, in what you do. Yeah, I'm glad you see that. Yeah. Cause I, and I really adored Diane Arbus as well. And, you know, I think it's quite interesting looking at the contrast of her commercial work as compared to the work she made for herself. And, um, I was also fascinated, I don't know if you know the photographer August Sander, and he sort of um, documented working class people in the, um, hmm. in the environments in which they worked and, you know, wearing their uniforms or what they would be wearing um, while they were working. And I was quite fascinated with that idea of, yeah, people just sort of almost being put upon in a sense within hmm. his all right, here I am. I'm going to make a photo of you. Stand still. Uh-huh. 
yeah. <laughs> kind of, literally, yeah, that that idea of capturing a person I find um, quite interesting. And that balance between something that feels candid and also staged. There's really that fascinating line where someone is clearly knows they're being photographed, but seems at ease in front of the camera. And I think that your figures also have that sense about them that is always comes off as an incredible confidence. Yeah, I think I think she's, I mean that the idea of the gaze I think is an eternally fascinating sort of idea that um, yeah the idea of being looking being looked at and and being captured in a picture you know a, a person awkwardly in a photograph or maybe they're more confident you know the contrast of I guess um you know ethnographic photography versus sort of luxury fashion photography is quite stark but at the same time the similarities are interesting I've also been trying to get a little bit better um in the podcast of just uh, physically explaining the work too before we dive too deeply into it essentially the pictures I make are figurative and um I utilise anthropomorphism and body decoration when creating characters in my work. Uh, I'm interested in how people express individuality and ideas about transformation and otherness. And I'm really interested in how the body can be used as a vehicle for telling a story. And I suppose that's Mm -hmm. a, a summary, yeah. You know, in terms of compositionally, you have these really... Graphic images, they tend to be portraits of, again, you said anthropomorphic animals, often sort of human body, animal head, um, that look like very formalized portraits, but the bodies are always adorned, sometimes in various stages of dress, very often tattoos. Would you say always tattoos? Yeah, certainly, you know, of my work over the last several years, def- that's definitely been a, a fascination that I've had. Yeah. Because I think that all goes to this idea of the body and self-expression and the ways that we choose to alter the bodies with which we are born to communicate something to the outside world. It's interesting. I was giving an artist talk to some high school students a few weeks ago and One of the things I always like to say to students when I speak with them is, it's Robert Rauschenberg said, there is no poor subject. Hmm. And I think I love that idea that everything is valid. You know, wherever your interests lie, you know, follow it in a way. When I was a kid, um, my great aunt and uncle, they had a great book collection and I adored the books they had on Egyptian art, you know, half human half animal gods and goddesses I just thought were amazing and the idea that a culture of revered animal qualities really gelled with me even at a young age but also as a kid I loved cartoons and comics Mm -hmm. and you know the idea of the um, anthropomorphic animal characters Bugs Bunny and the like from both of those interests Egyptian art and cartoons and comics also fed into my aesthetic somewhat because it's very much about simplifying things, looking at shape and line, particularly in cartoons and comics, you know, bold line with often solid colours. Do you find that you kind of start with a notion of a character that you feel like needs to be brought into the world? Or do you kind of start drawing and doodling and sort of have that character be revealed to you through the actual creative process? No, I'm thinking in the beginning, you know, is this character an introvert or an extrovert? And where will I take that? Often the frustrating thing is you have it, you think you've got a really certain idea, but then it will end up being completely different from what you initially start when you first scribbling. But uh, I sort of approach it in a few different ways because often I'm looking at an actual animal and then sort of transcribing that into um, or sometimes what I call a manimal. Sometimes it's a person that I'm turning into an animal creature mm. and other times it will be purely an imagined character. And I'm hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about 
your process specifically? You know, how the images from your sketchbook actually make their way into becoming prints? Yeah, so I guess for the probably the past decade I've focused on liner cutting and specifically sort of hand colouring liner cut prints. So once I've done the drawing and got it to a scale that I like, I transfer it onto the liner block and then cut away with my UMV gouges and get the image, you know, to a state where I'm happy with it and it's ready to be printed. So at the printing stage, I use oil-based ink and print onto a bright white, really smooth paper called Somerset. And once the printed element has dried, then I go to the stage of hand colouring it. So I use pigmented drawing inks and watercolour to hand colour the print. And once the hand colouring is dried, then I flatten them and then they're sort of ready to finish off and sign the edition. And has this been sort of for your last like couple bodies of prints, this has been pretty consistent for you? Yeah, sort of prior to that, I was working with sort of monochromatic liner cut, just black and white. And colour has always really been a challenge for me. So I thought, oh, I'll bite the bullet, start to include it. <laughs> and once I did take the leap, I'm sort of really enjoying that challenge. So now colour is sort of an integral part to sort of suggest um, environment that the characters might be within, um, maybe suggest an emotional reaction that might be encouraging the viewer to feel and have a response to the colour in a certain way. Although there's no guarantee of that, it's sort of something I like playing around with sort of that emotional um, quality of colour. Another interest of mine um, is pop art. You know, I love the idea of things being, I guess, relayed through media that the average person on the street can relate to or understand. That idea of a very simple, bold, graphic line. I love that idea of accessibility as well. Yes. Yeah, I think I agree. Yeah, it's something I really adored the idea of an image being able to exist in multiple from the very beginning. Like it's something that I thought was a fantastic quality of printmaking. And, you know, the other thing was in third year of university, we had a technician, Jackie Comer, and she initiated a print exchange. And I couldn't believe the lecturers were going to be part of it as well. And so all the students, um, lecturers and technician made an addition and then we all got one of each other's as a sort of um, memento, I guess, of our study. And, oh, it was flawed. You know, it was remarkable. I love I still have it now. You know, I love it. Mm -hmm. Having that record of a piece of work of everyone I studied with and the people who taught me, it, it was something that made a really big impression upon me, that shareability. Yeah, to be in a, an exchange or a portfolio and, you know, you can get incredible work and it's just, you know, in exchange for your own. It's really beautiful. And I think that printmaking also has this sense of it where, you know, accessibility within certain circles of the art world can be almost a, you know, a dirty word, right? That like if you're making something that someone who doesn't know art responds to, you're somehow not making something that belongs within the elite. And I think that printmakers kind of naturally have an aversion to this as a group to make a broad generalization because we are interested in accessibility and we are interested in dispersing the artwork that gets created. And so I like that so much as a part of the printmaking culture as well is that I I, I don't see that kind of snobbery as much as I do in other places in the art world no I would agree and you know printmakers are great swappers like they're always happy to do a swap which I think is a fantastic thing and you know potentially I think it's probably you know their natural personality but also then you know you're in the studio workshop environment when you're learning often if you want to continue making prints when you leave study um, you access a workshop you know, where other artists are working like there's a, quite a communal spirit amongst printmakers that in a way you have to 
have as part of you in a sense to engage in that medium but very much when you're beginning I think especially but you know I love it it's like I used to teach at for oh, I was there for over a decade and when I was teaching printmaking we would also always have a assignment that was an exchange player and I'd always make a piece of work as well when I taught photography we did that as well and the students loved it you know they were so engaged with the idea of it that it was always really rewarding. I'd love to circle back for a moment to talk about your work specifically and this idea that just sort of has popped up as we were chatting where you know your work is so much about the body and expression through the body and the way we use the body and I'm wondering if that has any particular connection to the fact that you're an athlete, that you are someone <laughs> who, who uses the body, you know, not only in the kind of abst- you know, the, the abstract world, um, so but funny. in the physical world as well. Um, I, if you've I ever thought of that. I don't know how to apply the term athlete. But you're a but that you're a boxer. So funny. Oh, <laughs> but you I'm, but you are a boxer though, and that's an incredibly athletic undertaking. <laughs> I know. It's so, oh, that's so funny. I, it's really interesting. It's like I, in high school, I did rowing and sort of competed a little bit, but it was more as my best friend did, and so I kind of tagged along and did that. And then for many many years, yeah, you know, I I didn't do any sort of form of exercise and then I sort of hit, hit middle age and went oh the old back's getting a bit stiff maybe I should start doing some exercise so I ended up going to the gym and I thought right to be accountable I'll have a personal trainer once a week because that will make me train more because otherwise I'll get in trouble with them so we ended up you know hitting the pads and starting doing a bit of boxing, you know, and then the next thing I know, I'm getting a mouse guard made and all of a sudden sparring, <laughs> sparring with the juicy boys after school hours and then thinking, oh, maybe I should really just go in a competition. But um, I think it, it probably does tie in, you know, that I, I like the idea of pushing limits and testing what you're made of if you know what I mean and I think um that probably does tie in somewhat with my work being interested in different types of people and types of personalities and different motivations for sure but yeah oh I love boxing I did a bit of boxing in the last couple of years yeah and I loved it I loved it so much and I recently had to had to quit and I really miss it. And so I just I loved it, though, because it was it's the most cathartic experience. And there's something about sparring that I mean, talk about meditative, like you are never more present than when someone's trying to hit you in the face. Oh, I know. I know. I, 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 it's interesting. I think it's funny when you bring up boxing because it makes me think about the links between what I'm interested in expressing in my work and then maybe what is part of boxing because I, I a lot of my characters you know, look a bit show-offy but at the same time I'm very interested in vulnerability so you know, oh. there's a, a performative aspect I guess to the characters because often they're looking straight at you and engaging with you and sort of inviting you to judge them and you know decide what you think about them and I think with boxing you know, you are never more vulnerable because you simply cannot hide there is nowhere to hide you're only as good as you are and that that's all there is you know you can't pretend that you're better oh that's fascinating and I think it's a, it's a little bit like being an artist you know when you have an exhibition you are completely exposing yourself and inviting people to you know, judge work in a sense, which is not a negative thing. It's just a natural part of the process. But yeah, when you're boxing, you're right, you're in that ring with one other person or when you're competing, you've got the referee in there as well. But um, you can only do your best, you know. There's no further you can go in, as you say, in that moment. And I think to be exposed in that way is, is a really interesting space. That is so fascinating. And I completely identify with that feeling in that moment of realization 
of how vulnerable you are because you know if you're if you're doing boxing and you're doing like bag work or drills or something like that there's a certain um sense of like oh yeah like look how hard I can hit this bag and like look how look how many push-ups I can do and then you know look at how like you know look how and like whatever it is there's that little bit of like ego and it feels good but then when you get in a ring with someone any of that like outside like what you may be perceived as completely goes away and you you're just that sense of like wow like it really like all that's like left is like two raw talents and who's you know who's who's quicker who reads bodies better that's kind of the only thing that's left and it is it's super vulnerable and at the same time there's of course like this great tradition of showiness with boxers yeah you know that the the capes and the coming in and the exactly uh, the per- big personalities yeah totally yeah yeah and i mean you know, there's obvious kind of um parallels like printmaking there's a lot of repetition involved and you have to be very te- technical and almost have a certain restraint at times because the i find printmaking is an is a mediator in a way which is something I love, you know, I think that's a great thing about it. And, you know, in boxing, your training is just repetition, repetition, repetition. But come the day, it's like, will that kick in? You know, because as an artist, you do your training and you and one of my big things is trust the process. And in boxing, you go, oh, my goodness, can I trust myself, you know, to execute on the day of yeah. competition? It's quite fascinating because, I mean, as, as well with printmaking, like I – it's very superstitious. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. if you set the press up a certain way one day and it all works, it's got to be exactly that way every time. You know, that kind of thing. And like with boxing, you know, everything, you've got to have everything right. All the good socks, you've got to have your good socks. Oh, on. yeah. <laughs> it's got to feel comfortable. I, 100%. I had the sports bra that was like the lucky the sports lucky bra. One. That, like, you the can't, lucky one. You, you know. <laughs> You cannot have a good day without this one. And yeah, I just, I I think that's so fascinating in that idea of trusting the process because I know that like you can train and train. And I know the first couple of times I was ever in a sparring situation, everything just flew out of my head. You know, it was like all of a sudden you're just like, you know, running around like the schoolyard, like, no, don't hit me, you know? I know, I know. I can't even remember my first match. Like, I remember things about it, but I just, it was just such a flurry of adrenaline. It was crazy. And it's amazing then the more you go on, you've got to find that calm spot in the chaos. It's, re- it's really interesting. And I think that's the same with um, printmaking in a weird way, especially when I used to teach, because obviously you've got set class times and all this kind of thing. And I'd be teaching liner cut and then people would crazily start cutting their liner cuts and I'd say, hey, 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 put the brakes on. You have to work at the lino's pace. You don't tell it how fast you want to go. I said, if you want to achieve, you know, what you want to achieve, deep breaths, be one with the lino. <laughs> You've got to work with yeah. it, not against yeah. it. Because <laughs> I think process often dictates the pace. It's quite an interesting thing, and I think that's with you know all art forms, and particularly printmaking. Often, the different um, techniques dictate the pace that you can move at. You know, you can't rush an etch. It is what it is. You know, with lithography, you can't rush sponging, or you'll stuff it up. It's like you've just got to embrace the process, trust it, go with it. Yeah. And which, I was thinking one other kind of thought, sort of circling back to this idea of that kind of swagger and that presence that some of your figures have, but also that interest in vulnerability. And it hasn't occurred to me until we're just talking about it now, but that really is, there. of course, they're two sides of the same coin. You know, like it's it's saying, you know, to have confidence is to be comfortable with vulnerability, because that's what that is. Because of course, when you, when someone's shrinking or or trying to protect themselves, it's fear of of being hurt, and so they you kind of you can't have one 
without the other. And I think that your figures do that so well because there's this this presence in them, but also a vulnerability as well. And I don't know, I'm wondering how much of that comes from the fact that you're using animals because we we have uh, such a sense of kind of stewardship over them, particularly domesticated animals. Yes, that's right, yeah. And I think, you know, I've very much focused on the domestic animal for a long time. And I think it is that, I, like, I'm quite interested in body language. You know, you were talking before about the posture of the um, figures and that kind of thing. And, you know, that idea of an animal when it exposes its belly to you for a pat and that kind of thing. And I think that's why I'm interested mm. in skin as well. You know, it, it, it's interesting to think about what do we conceal, what do we reveal um, that idea of hiding or sharing, those sorts of things. And, you know, the notion of trust when you're exposed and that sort of thing. Yeah, they're all ideas that I like, that I think t- tie in with that notion of the gaze mm-hmm. as well. That, um, yeah, because, you know, even it's interesting, particularly, you know, going back to talking about social media in a um, from a, another respect, you know, people expose so much of themselves through social media and then get upset when right. they're judged. And it's kind of like, well, that, that's what we do. You know, that is what humans do. We love, we're fascinated with characterizing and judging and putting things in mm-hmm. holes, you know, like um, filing things away, trying to make sense out of things, trying to make life neat, you know, we constantly need to be making judgments so that we go, right, I've made a decision on that, let's move on to the next thing. You know, it, it, it's what our brains love doing, you know, and I and whilst it can be negative, I don't think that that is intrinsically a negative quality. You know, I, I see it as a way that we try and make sense of the world. So what I love is when I have an exhibition I love getting feedback of people coming up and sort of telling me what they what their favourite work is and if it reminds them of a person they know or how they engage with it. Because you know, there's certain characters of mine that I I go, oh, I don't know if I would be friends with you or not. <laughs> and when I hang a show, often um, if, it, if the actual installation is being done for me, I have to send notes to say these two pictures can't be next to each other. And they say, why? And I say, because they wouldn't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> the characters in them yeah. would not be friends. <laughs> it's kind of, so it's, it's weird how you even anthropomorphize your own work itself in that way but um you know I certainly have a very firm idea of the backstory for my work but I'm very happy when the audience comes to it and brings their own narrative you know that's one of my favorite things I'm not set in my ways about how the work needs to be read because just like people we like some people and not others and that's what I find interesting about when people engage with my work I think it's really good when authors of work can just sort of release meaning in that way and and understand that it's going to mean something to them and something else to someone else seeing it and a third thing to a third person seeing it and that meaning doesn't have to be static and it's so much more interesting when it's not. I think so and I think you know when you can let go of that it's really rewarding because you can take on feedback and you know every now and then something someone says might make something click in your mind you know and think make you think about where you might push something next or wow I'd never seen that link that they brought up before or a connection so it's a good thing you know I think it's only a positive thing to allow multiple readings of your work definitely I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the use of tattoos sort of specifically because that's a a really fascinating point of the work in terms of like what we where you're talking about this idea of what we show and what we conceal and a lot of your recent figures with their tattoos you know they'll have tattoos they'll be standing there shirtless or with a tank top on and they'll have you know tattoos that would be concealable if someone was wearing just a t-shirt but you can see them and they're kind of, you know, a lot of them that are, are, are more traditional tattoos or um, 
edgy tattoos, you know, like 666, like that kind of thing for some of the characters. And um, yeah, it's just, it's an, an interesting element of your work. And I just love to hear you to speak about it. Yeah, I think um, like pictorially, what fascinates me about using the tattoo as a motif is I, I love the idea of a picture mm. within a picture. So that, you know, from a compositional point of view, I really enjoy playing with that idea. But you know, I suppose my interest in them would have originally stemmed from when I was quite young. And my mother was from Broken Hill and a lot of her relatives were minors and they had tattoos. And I mean, obviously they worked underground a lot, but they also spent a lot of time in the very harsh sun yeah. um, <laughs> in that part of New South Wales in Australia. And, you know, their tattoos were kind of almost more like a birthmark. You know, they were sort of faded and just so much part of them and their skin and their body that I, I just loved looking at them. You know, I thought they were just amazing. And, you know, they were very traditional sort of things. But I think that something that just stayed with me and I was always kind of interested in. And then you sort of get into music when you're a teenager. And, of course, tattoos are often a part of that for certain types of musicians and that sort of thing so then you are more exposed to it and then when I moved out of home I actually lived in a share house with a guy who was doing a tattoo apprenticeship so then I started getting tattoos myself and sort of experiencing the idea of wearing them and it got to talking about where I grew up was a little bit more conservative you know you get a tattoo you certainly find out about people judging you yeah so, <laughs> The tattoo is a really interesting device, you know, for exploring ideas about attraction and repulsion as oh, well. Oh, for sure, yeah. It's quite fascinating. But it's what I find funny about my work is often that kids really like it, you know, and they're not, <laughs> they don't mind. But it's kind of unusual, you know, they're sort of fascinated in it. But uh, one of my favourite things was when my nephew, oh, he would have been about four he came to one of my shows and I asked him to give me a review of the work, what's his expression, and he kind of said, sad. Really? And spooky. And I thought, oh, he's really kind of tapped into a bit of, of what I'm interested in because, you know, I'm quite interested in personal histories and the idea of the tattoo reflecting on... A, a life lived mm -hmm. in a sense yeah. and I thought it was kind of interesting how he had tapped in on the idea that often the, maybe the expression of the figures is a little bit jaded or world weary mm -hmm. and that was something that I appreciated that he picked up on <laughs> at such a young age. That's so interesting because there's, well, there's a bunch of different things in there because I think one is that because you do use graphic images and bright colors and animals, I think that a cursory glance, someone might come away thinking like, oh, that's cute. Look at, you know, look at the little, like, you know, if yeah. you're not, if someone who's not engaging with it, because exactly. these are things that, of course, we, we you yeah. know, we associate with brightness. Yes, and the surface reading of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the surface reading, but when you stop and spend a little bit more time with them, you know, you do see that kind of world weariness which again always reminds me of like fashion photography like when you know when <laughs> like when do you see a model smiling I mean really like <laughs> yeah yeah that, that there is that cool element of it as well so that's and that's really interesting yeah that your nephew someone who was just not really necessarily engaging with the work, work might think like oh yeah this would be something that'd be cute for a four-year-old that the four-year-old <laughs> is the one who's like who's like these animals have been through some shit. Like That's he's like right. picked up totally on it. Yeah, totally yeah. tuned in on it. So I I love that. <laughs> yeah, because I yeah I really like that idea of us the body telling a story. I find that interesting. Yeah. And and yeah, and just all that idea of, of of tattoos and that decisions that we make to to mark ourselves in a way that becomes a snapshot of where we were in our lives at that time. Yes. And we continue to change, but the tattoo doesn't. And I think that that's what stopped me from getting tattoos until I was 30 is that I was really sort of fearful of that idea that 
that oh like if what if I don't like it anymore what if I don't what if I what if 35 year old Miranda hates 25 year old Miranda you know these kinds of fears yes the notion of regret I find quite interesting mm-hmm. it, yes, it's yes thing that's intrinsically tied into it isn't it but isn't it funny that when you finally do get marked it all of a sudden is not that a big a deal as you thought it was Totally. It kind of really breaks through a barrier of preciousness. I think it's quite interesting. I completely agree. Like, not that, it, not that it's not important. Like, I think it still can be important. But, yeah, it just it doesn't seem quite so precious anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's an element of, of trusting yourself that I found yes. to be really liberating. Yeah. And I think particularly as as women, you're trained to second guess yourself and your instincts and um, like all the time. And and this element of like, no, like I know me and I know what I want and I'm comfortable with the idea of a future regret as well. But I also <laughs> trust myself in this moment. And it's yeah, it's really interesting. And I think that's part of the reason why. There, I feel like there are very few people who just have one tattoo. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you either have none or you become fascinated, and especially if you're philosophically minded at all, it's incredibly interesting process to choose and decide and all of all of the things and where people place it, you know, like as all of my tattoos are quite visible, they're, you know, they're all below my shoulders on my arms, so... There's something about me, which is like an extrovert, you know, maybe I've got, yeah. I've, we could get like even spookier about it. You know, I've got a lot of fire sign placements, you know, I'm like, I'm just that kind of <laughs> classic, like, you know, um, extroverted person that I, for me, I remember even like, why would you even get a tattoo that no one would see? <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> I know. Well, see, it's quite fascinating because that. It, it's funny you say that because when they, you know, found Oscar the Iceman and, you know, the discovery sort of made people think, oh, he's got tattoos, but no one ever would have seen them because he would have been rugged up mm, mm-hmm. for the climate conditions. So the thinking is that, you know, they were for actual medicinal purposes oh. or perhaps you know, that because um, I think one was on the back of the knee, for example, and they're thinking, why would it be there? And you're thinking, well, maybe it was a kind of protective or medicinal thing for an injury or something like that, you know, which is all hypothetical because obviously they will never really know. Right, right. But um, you know, I think I think motivation is interesting. And, and as you say, are you an introvert or extrovert? Where is your tattoo placed? You know, what is it for? Is it a memento? Is it a memorial? Does it show certain proclivities or a, a sense of hierarchy within the social system? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what are you? Is it just things that you like? Yeah, it's a really interesting thing, that idea of getting, yeah, a permanent picture on your body to me. Mm-hmm. Is fascinating. And I talk, going back to regret, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I think regret, it's such a big thing of <laughs> being part of being an artist. <laughs> it's like, you know, particularly with printmaking, because with my chosen medium now that I work in permanently being liner cut, if you cut something oh, away, yeah. you know, I don't care how many people say you can glue it back on <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> if you're hardcore auditioning, it, it pretty much never holds up. So that idea of, yeah, you've got to make, in particularly in my work because it's very linear, you know, I've got to make very precise marks, you know, so there's that pressure. But then also, you know, pictorially about the imagery you're making, you might finish a work and then all of a sudden have a light bulb moment where you think, why didn't I do this to that <laughs> picture? Why didn't I? I should have yeah. put this in it instead of that, you know, which obviously is the stuff that keeps you more excited and propels forward to make more work. But... I, I love the artist Phil Gustin and I think he said something like satisfaction means nothing, frustration is everything and I really, I, I gel with that, you know, I think you don't want to be comfortable, you mm-hmm. always sort of want to be propelled forward on that little tank of frustration yeah. <laughs> It keeps you going. Yeah, I love that. One of the things that I 
when I first started getting tattoos that I, I came to this realization that, you know, in terms of regret, like, this is going to be a little, a little dark, you know, really the worst thing that's going to happen is like when I'm in the slab going into the incinerator, someone's going to look at my tattoos and say, eh, someone was born in the eighties, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just like, in I go, you know, <laughs> like, I just... know, I know, it's so funny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I know it is a bit like that, a thing, but you know, at the same time, that is, I love that quality about tattooing. You know, it's kind of like, it's just like this amazing patchwork on, you know, a body that, yeah, I don't, you can sort of read so much into and whether that's accurate or not, who knows unless mm-hmm. you speak to somebody. But I really like that idea that someone's imagination can be ignited by body decoration. And yeah. I think that's what attracts me to using it in my work as well, that it, re- it really... Um, gets people to engage and start making up a story or a narrative in their own mind mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it's encouraging them to really interact and engage with the imagery. Well, I feel like I could keep talking to you about tattoos and boxing and <laughs> art, like, for just about ever, but to wrap things up, I always love to end by asking... Uh, you to let people know where they can find you and your work and see it and or any exhibitions you have coming up anything in that camp um, I'd love to hear you you talk about that yeah so 2020 will be a big year for me I've got a solo exhibition at Penny Contemporary in Tasmania and also one at Australian Galleries in Melbourne and then I'll also have another solo show at Barringer Cultural Centre in Upway in Melbourne as well as group shows in New Zealand at Solander Gallery and in Adelaide at West Gallery Feverton and you can find my website is ronagreen.com on Instagram I'm Rona Green Art and on Facebook I'm Rona Green Artist. Beautiful. I will put links to, to all of those and to the galleries in the show notes so people can easily follow up with you. And yeah, thank you again for for taking the time to to talk with me. It's just been just absolutely a delight to to dive into all of it with you. And I'm really looking forward to sharing it with people. Oh, thanks so much for the opportunity, Miranda. I've loved chatting with you. Thanks, Kate. Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again in two weeks' time when my guest will be Joseph Velasquez. There's so much to say about Joseph. I'm not sure where to begin. So let me just get you all pumped by telling you he's a founder of Drive-By Press, a mobile printmaking studio which toured with bands such as Spoon. He's a beautiful speaker about community engagement and printmaking, and he has coordinated a recent fundraiser and donation called Let's Leave a Press that got a brand new Takish Press to Puerto Rico in preparation for SGCI 2020. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you in two weeks.